The final reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and it's a short chapter, so it's the entirety of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In this holy scripture, listen for God's word to you. Now concerning food, sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this uh, somewhat obscure passage, about an issue that we really don't face today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would underscore for us the deep abiding virtues and vices within this passage from Paul, so that through his words, we could discern a whisper that comes from you. So we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name, amen. We know more about the Apostle Paul's relationship to these Christians in Corinth more than any other church that Paul helped to establish, any other church to which Paul wrote. And if we look at the scholarly consensus here, uh, we believe that Paul wrote four letters to this church. One of them, the first one, lost forever to history. We just don't have a copy of it. And the other three letters consist of an enormous part of the New Testament, two entire books, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 29 chapters. Paul actually founded this church when he visited Corinth. And because it was a difficult church to, to begin to get them off of the ground, Paul stayed with them for the first 18 months. He normally didn't do that. But after he felt like he had got them out of the starting blocks, that things were going well, he then handed off the task of shepherding this church to a really young yet gifted preacher named Apollos, and Paul thought that he had finished his work. He had planted the seed of the gospel, the good news was now beginning to grow, and now it was going to be Apollos' job to see things through from there. But then as Paul got away from the church, everything started to fall apart. This church started to splinter. All kinds of divisions. Uh, one person was speaking out openly about how Paul had got the gospel all wrong and he became a real rabble rouser. I love that phrase. A rabble rouser. Rabble, rabble, rabble. <laughs> Causing all kinds of trouble 
in the church. And so Paul gets news of this, and this is when he starts writing to them, and it doesn't appear to be the band-aid that's going to heal things and, and bring them back together. And then it must have broken his heart that on one occasion, Paul actually went back to visit in person, thinking that would solve the problem. But instead, the troublemaker had got such a following behind him that they sent Paul away with his tail tucked between his legs. They had no more respect for him. But Paul held on to his original love for that congregation and continued to write to them. And he even made one more visit. They discovered that they finally realized the fellow was a lot of trouble and they had kicked him out of the congregation and this time they welcomed Paul and it finally looked like everything at Corinth was going to be okay. And then unfortunately, as often happens, things came full circle and right before we believe Paul was killed, executed by being beheaded in Rome, he got news that once again, things at the church at Corinth were not going too well. Their problem that's being addressed in chapter 8 isn't just a chapter 8 problem. It's really the primary issue that has caused all of the struggles within this congregation. They think by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ and that giving them a knowledge that other people don't have, that that makes them better than other people. Rather than being humbled by God's grace and the love of God that they had learned about through the story of Jesus, they, as Paul writes in this letter, they allowed that knowledge to puff them up, to make them arrogant, rather than actually building up the church the family of faith. And this is what Paul's addressing in this letter. I've shared many stories behind this pulpit about what a sheltered childhood I had. Only child of a preacher and teacher. And when I was a child, oh, did that knowledge puff me up. I could recite all 66 books of the Bible in order in less than 20 seconds. I knew God's rule book better than anyone else. And this childhood arrogance, and this one I'm so embarrassed by. Oh, we're actually not recording today. I'm glad about this. Good. This is one I didn't want to get out there. This is providential for me. In sixth grade, I fashioned myself a prophet much in the vein of the great Elijah or Jeremiah or Isaiah. And out at the playground during recess, I one day picked up a branch as if it were the very staff that Moses had used to part the waters near Sinai, the very rod that he struck against the rock at Oreb so that water would flow. I had a rather outgoing personality, so I gathered up quite a following of fellow sixth graders. And as their leading prophet, I had the purity test for them over whether or not they could be part of my group with my staff in hand. I started asking questions, and I immediately had to kick out one young boy because he was something called a Presbyterian, and we were Baptists. Another young man I sent into exile away from our group because he was telling jokes from a TV show called Cheers. And I had to send him away, probably out of jealousy, because I was not allowed to watch that show because it was set in a bar. <laughs> One boy even bragged about stealing a cigarette from his mother. And boy, did we send him away because we knew the sulfur and fire that punished Sodom would be coming down upon him soon. All this to say, 12-year-old Jason had so much knowledge that had puffed him up, he would be certain that 48-year-old Jason was going straight to hell. As we grow, we go through what I think can rightly be called stages of faith. As a matter of fact, Stages of Faith is the title of perhaps the most important book written in the 20th century about the psychology of religion. What goes, in our, what goes on in our minds as we grow and try to understand these faith stories, these religious stories, what does it mean about us and the way these stories and these teachings 
will shape our lives. And James Fowler, as he writes this book, he goes through what things are like even in, at, for infants to young childhood. And then he says most of us in his six stages of faith, most of us end up at stage three or four and we kind of get stuck there and we never grow any further. As a matter of fact, Fowler asserts that he by no means ever has gotten close to stage six. He reserves that for folks like Mother Teresa and Mahatma Gandhi. But he says most of us don't even get to stage five. We get stuck in stage three or four where in stage three, we think that our group has all of the knowledge and that's the way it has to be and therefore no one else belongs, certainly not if they disagree with us. The stage four may sound a little better, but I'm not sure it is. It's where we learn to quit going with the group think and we individuate. We form a strong sense of our self-identity and we can present our convictions, our, our deepest beliefs in a way that it really does form our lives and shape the direction of our lives, but it doesn't mean that we necessarily have virtue because we can still be puffed up in our knowledge. We can still be arrogant. Well, that's what's going on with this church in Corinth. Notice that Paul writes, I think, with some irony and some subversiveness when he says, those of you that have knowledge, and you know that would have piqued their ears, saying, oh, he's talking about us. We're the smart ones in the church. He says, those of you that have knowledge, in the second verse, he says, those of you that have knowledge, you lack the necessary knowledge. You may know some stuff, but you don't know the stuff that really matters. And that's why, although this situation described in chapter 8 may sound really strange and foreign to us, stay with me, stay on the same page with me for a moment as we unpack what's going on 2,000 years ago here and then cross the bridge with me for why it really does matter today. This is a church, as I stated earlier, that had given Paul all kinds of problems. And he starts going down the menu of all of their errors in chapter 1. Chapter 7, the chapter that precedes this, he writes to them about the sin that many of the men in the church need to surrender. You see, in Corinth, they worshipped other gods, as just every city did during this time period. And one of the primary gods in Corinth was a goddess named Aphrodite. And the way you would worship Aphrodite, by the way, this would be a booming religion in America today, the way you worship Aphrodite is you go to her temple and you pay the priest who work at her temple to sleep with one of the prostitutes the priest have hired to work there. So you go to church and you pay an offering to sleep with a prostitute and you've made the goddess happy. That would go over well today, I think. Paul, in chapter 7, writes against this practice to say, once you've accepted Jesus and started following Jesus, you need to stop doing that. That, to me, is one of the biggest no-duh passages in Scripture. Follow Jesus, quit worshiping Aphrodite and sleeping with the prostitutes. Okay. Chapter 8 moves into another dilemma. With many of these gods, akin to what we think of with the Old Testament worship, a way of worshiping the god is to bring some of your livestock, something that's valuable to the priest and the place of worship, and then that livestock, that animal, could be offered as a sacrifice and the gods would be pleased with you. Of course, the way the temple makes the money is to hang on to some of that meat that has been sacrificed to the idol and then you can sell it to the general public and you can fill your coffers that way. The Christians in Corinth that knew they belonged to Jesus and these other gods didn't exist, they said, well, because the gods don't exist, it's fine for us to go there and buy that meat. Even though it's been sacrificed to an idol, the idol, the god, doesn't exist. It's just meat. I can use that to feed myself and my family. And please stay with me here. Paul says to them, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There is no sin at all in you going to buy the meat because you know that god doesn't exist. So the sin, the problem, 
It's not that you're buying the meat. The sin is that they're thinking only of themselves, the rights that they have, the freedom, the liberty that they have, because we know those other gods don't exist. We are allowed to do this because we've been saved by Christ and we know none of the other gods exist. And this is where Paul cautions them and tells them, this is why you lack the necessary knowledge. You're right that eating that meat is not a sin. But think about the rookie Christians. Think about the newbies. The ones that have just started coming to your gathering of worship in what would have been someone's house church. And and they're just learning about Jesus and his gospel, about the love of God and being saved from their sins. And they understand that if they belong to Jesus, that means they turn everything else away. And so their consciences are weak because they're just babies. They're growing. And then they're out in public. They're out in the marketplace. And they walk by and they see you chomping down on a Zeus burger. Well, what, what is this all about? We, he's one of the leaders in our church. And, and here he is eating this meat sacrifice to idols. And so Paul says, even though you have every right to do it, and it's not a sin in and of itself, if you're still prioritizing yourself, Something about God's love hasn't gotten through. Because the true knowledge, really knowing Jesus Christ, is to know God's love. And not just love as an abstraction, not just love as a feeling, but love as you have seen it manifested and lived out in the story of Jesus. In his teachings, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, you have seen love defined. And love is not about getting your own way. Love is not about what you have a right to do or what you're free to do. Love is intended to mature to the point where we are so thankful, we are so grateful for what it is to know this gospel that no matter what we have done, no matter what has been done to us, no matter what we've been through, God's love for all of us is unconditional. And when that truth penetrates our souls and becomes a a, a part of who we are, the only true genuine sign is gratitude. And if it's gratitude to someone who loved us so much that he sacrificed his own life so we could see that love, then the call of the gospel is that we find creative ways to spend our lives in service to others rather than asserting, these are my rights. This is my freedom. Christ has granted to all of us a freedom that is much more. I know it sounds like a strange passage in chapter 8. What is this stuff about eating meat sacrificed to idols? But believe it or not, this kicks off where Paul is going to go for almost the remainder of the letter. Because in the next chapter, as he focuses on his service to others out of love for Christ, he says, I have become whatever I need to be for every single person so that they could come to know the love of Jesus. If they are a Jew, I become like a Jew. If they're under the law, I become like one under the law. If they're a Gentile, I become like a Gentile. If they're like one not under the law, I became like one not under the law. Whatever it takes. I find a way to be with that person so that somehow through me they can see a glimpse of the love of Jesus. He he moves on from there in the next chapter, the 10th chapter, to say, although our freedom in Christ makes all things permissible, we've been forgiven. It's said and done. All things are permissible. We have absolute liberty. That does not mean that all things are beneficial. Just because you've been forgiven and you're allowed all things doesn't mean that it's going to be beneficial to you or to your church family. Move forward in in chapter 11. He looks at the way they practice communion. We'll be having communion next week. And he scolds them because when they have communion, it's in someone's home, someone wealthy enough to host all of these Jesus followers 
And because it's a wealthy person's home, they make sure the chairs around the table are given to the other wealthy members in the church and the poor people in the church are pushed to the back. Maybe they'll get a crumb if there's something left over. And Paul says, that's not what it is to follow Jesus. In chapter 12, the next chapter, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Paul uses the example of speaking in tongues becoming way too big a part of their worship service. And he says, don't you realize when you speak in tongues and worship, you're turning the worship of the holy and loving God into a look at me, look at me circus and says, no, it's not about you. It's about you getting out of the way so other people can see Jesus. And if all these follow-up stories haven't made the point, the most beautiful chapter engraved on one of our plaques on the back wall there, oftentimes called the love chapter, this is what Paul has to say about the relationship between love and knowledge. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Knowledge about God is useless. I dare say non-existent unless our so-called knowledge of God is crowned by our gratitude for his inexhaustible and unconditional love for all of us. Any of us who can remember back to that first time we were looking for a job or maybe later on hoping to get a promotion you know what it is just to get your foot in the door or that next rung up the ladder all of us have heard this before it's not what you know but it's who you know change that up just a little bit for the story of our faith while it is a good thing to supposedly know things about God, it is not what we know, but it is who loves us. It's not what you know, it's who loves you. And if we make sure we always bring ourselves back to that point of humility to remember this entire story of grace began with the conviction taking hold of our hearts because of Jesus, we trust that we are loved, we trust that we belong, and we are so thankful for that, that we look upon our brothers and sisters, we look upon our neighbors, and we would never want to do anything that would be a stumbling block in their journey. We don't look to puff ourselves up, but we do look to build one another up. Amen.